Well, good morning, everybody. You know, our first map today looks at the all hazards weather map from the National Weather Service. And it is kind of nice just to wake up to a morning where there's not widespread, you know, frost and freeze warnings across such a huge part of the country. This is kind of just a symptom of the overall shift we're getting in the jet stream, which is going to open up to more mild air across the country as we press forward. Now, that's not to say there's not quite a bit of colder air that's still down here in parts of the southeast. And we just look about 550 this morning. Uh, we did see, uh, you know, temperatures down here still hovering around that freezing mark and in some places dipping a little bit below that. But overall, we're going to watch the temperatures moderate and we're going to have to just pay close attention to our main story all week, which is the strength and the position of the Pacific jet stream as it's just coming across and what it's going to do across the United States. Now, as of late, what it's done is it's hit mostly the Pacific Northwest. We can see that in the last 48 hours, as we watch kind of our first of multiple storm systems coming into the Northwest deliver um, relatively heavy rainfall. Snow levels have been pretty high with this system, as we discussed, but this is just the beginning of what's going to be a very wet next uh, week or so across this area. Now, bigger picture things as we think about what's been changing. I'm going to jump very quickly to South America, because if you only got a couple of seconds, I wanted you to know this about South America. Um, the, one of the bigger shifts I saw in last night's model run was over the next 15 days, excuse me, over the next 15 days, we saw a substantial drying trend in the ensembles across a broad section of Brazil. Now, as you know, I had been suggesting that this area would start to have the lid taken off of it once we get well into next week. Uh, but the newest model runs kind of kept the suppression around despite better MJO movement to help this area out. So I was a bit bit confused by that and certainly I think got it wrong if this new model trend is, um, is kind of more representative of what to expect. But the long-standing flooding problems in southern Brazil just continue. Um, this is going to put water into the Parna River, which will be critical for the rest of the growing season. We did see the models back off a bit on some of the rainfall in Argentina. So that's our kind of our first uh, story that I want to give you that's a bit of an update over where we talked about things earlier in the week. The second is going to be on the upcoming precipitation pattern shift that we're going to get across the southern tier of the United States. Now, if we look back over the last two weeks, of course, most of what you're seeing here has been dominated by the large southeast ridge from a week to 10 days ago, the lack of good subtropical jet stream flow here, the stronger flow coming in and curling up that big low that just pulled all of that moisture through Texas, repeated days of rain. It got into the Midwest, big snows into Montana, North Dakota, heavy rain, severe weather in parts of Minnesota and uh, Wisconsin over to Michigan. And then we followed it up with another system. Remember, this was the Halloween one that came clipping down here all the way from Siberia and then exited New England. Now, I've drawn all over this, but the main point is to show you that in the last two weeks, while we've focused a lot on some folks that have had some very heavy, heavy rainfall, we cannot ignore some of these areas that have missed out and have been very dry. And one of the areas that I think we're seeing in the new model trends we've been watching is that there's going to be some substantial improvement for parts of the southeast, which has uh, started to slip into drop. We're going to look at the drop monitor in a second, but let's give you some updated stats and some of the big picture things we follow. First, the Mississippi River this morning, uh, up to minus... 7.78 feet. So if you look down here at the bottom, you know, right hand side, this has been the improvement we've watched over the last couple of weeks as that moisture has gotten in. Our main story here is that as we work our way through November into December, I don't expect this to make a big turn back down. Uh, if it does, that would go way against some of the current thinking with the way the jet stream is behaving and some of the longer range forecasts. So I expect it to continue to make a slow recovery. I think that once we get into the month of December, we'll be talking about it being back above low stage, but we'll have to see how this all kind of pans out. The other big change we've, we've had because of some of these recent rains is you go back a month ago to October the 3rd, and you can see just how extensive throughout the Mississippi Basin, the whole of it here, uh, we were dry at that you know, 40 inch or 100 centimeter level. And this is what's changed. So again, this was a month ago, and here is the most recent data. So one month ago and now. So these numbers starting to come up out of the basement here are exactly what needs to happen as we press forward. Now some of the cooler soils in the Midwest after the colder airs come through, plus this moisture is going to allow for a lot of fall field work once uh, you know the fields dry down enough to not do much damage to drive through them. So that's going to be important, I think, to watch as well. But on this kind of second theme, I want to get you to the latest drop monitor. So this is the newest map, and uh, we've seen some reduction primarily from this system last week. Now let me show you just how much. We can do this a couple of ways. I'm going to go to the comparison slider first, and I, I, I kind of find this really fascinating. So this is compared to one week ago. So this was a week ago. That's now. I'm going to kind of do it fast so you can see the changes. I think our eyes and brains process it better than if I just go, whoops, real nice and slow across the image. So there's a week ago, 
or forgive me, that's now. This was a week ago. Look at that. There's, there's major drops in some areas. So it's kind of nice to see that. If you'd rather just look at one map, this is the actual change map. So we can see in here where we've had class improvement, parts of Texas up to a three class improvement. And where we watched the degradation was primarily in the Tennessee Valley toward the Appalachian Mountains, the Mid-Atlantic. This is that area that got tucked under that, uh, that bigger ridge. So from a quick update on the new drought monitor, let's go ahead and have a look at some of the, the bigger picture things because I think this area has got the best chances of seeing some improvement in the rainfall once we get past this next seven days. And where that information is coming from is by looking at the wind field. Now I'm going to start you in Europe before I come back to what I think is important here because the tail end of that colder air, can you see it here, is actually kicking off numerous deep cyclones that have moved through the North Atlantic and hit Europe. And we've got more on the way. So Europe has had a very rough stretch of weather, big sections of Europe. I mean, I don't often go into detail about Europe. So when I say just one word, Europe, I want you to understand that locally some of the effects have been tremendous. But look at the strong wind field here. But I keep wanting to trace it back, and we keep having this discussion about the Tejano wind. Now, as we move toward our cold season, okay, Every time in the past that I've seen strong winds come through here like this, that indicates a deep penetration into the south of really cold air. And what it often does, and there's usually a few day lag on it, is it helps set up the south for more active systems. And what I mean by that is some coming out of the panhandles or coming out of the Arklatex region or coming out of the Gulf Coast, doesn't matter. We're gonna start to see better chances of getting a system to roll across some of those incredibly dry acres that make up a big section, for example, of our cotton belt. Um, the other piece to this is I gotta jump up here and just go straight to the jet stream level winds. And just like we talked about yesterday, they're still screaming across the North Atlantic. And uh, if you come over here to the Pacific, we continue to watch this extension of the Pacific jet be a major player going forward. So what's the result? Okay, so I, I kind of want to give you these two big stories at the beginning. The first, South America. The second is this. There's our next week for the South. While the Northwest gets hit, the storm track runs across the, across the U.S.-Canadian border. Now watch. About a week from now, this is a seven-day sliding window of average precipitation anomalies. Check out what's going on down here in the South. Now that shift has been pretty robust in the last few model runs. We're starting to see week two increase the rainfall in this area. Now to get this to happen, it's got two things really working toward it. The rebound in temperatures, the opening of the moisture, and then the subtropical jet that's finally starting to show up. So let's kind of get in and discuss those things and we'll take a look at some of the new long range data here in a few minutes and I'll give you another quick update on international weather to finish this one out. So our story all week has been about the jet stream level winds and we've had to watch it from the North Pole down to try to understand how this Pacific jet is going to be extending and then retracting. So playing this forward through Friday and into Saturday, this is when we begin to see by Saturday night into Sunday, Monday, the next piece of that extended jet showing up here in the Western United States. We're going to look at what that's doing. If there are storm systems, they roll to the north. That's where their main trajectory is going to be early. But we'll watch as we go from Monday into Tuesday of next week, the nose of this jet coming in here, kicking off a midweek system that's a bit farther to the south. Now, just remember, when we're thinking about where low pressure systems tend to develop, you can always take an extended piece of the jet stream like this and kind of put an oval around it and then divide it up into quadrants. The most preferred quadrant for low pressure development is always going to be on what we call the exit side, this side, and up in the left hand corner. We can also get some decent upper level divergence here that helps out, but this in this particular situation is going to be producing more systems on the nose of the jet as they, as they come through. Now I'm telling you that because as we go past next Wednesday towards Thursday and Friday, you see the jet moves through and then rolls out to the open ocean. So when you look at this, you go, wow, look at all that flow. No, no, no. This is not the right setup to be delivering systems on the back side of this. We need to wait till the next piece comes in to put the nose of the jet into play to get the upper level motion to, to, to really just cause the divergence and get the air sucked out of the way and drop some low pressure, all right? So watch this piece here. As the jet retracts in the North Pacific, the uh, uh, subtropical jet extends. And so this is next Friday, the 10th. And as we play this forward, what I'm watching is by next Tuesday, the 14th, through the 15th and 16th, this begins to show up. Now, 
The jet's still really moving here, but it's no longer extending all the way to the Pacific Northwest. But this piece right in through here, now look, there it is. The nose of it is there. That's what's going to help initiate more systems over parts of the south. It's also going to keep more mild air across the country. There isn't, in this particular setup, a cold air outbreak with this particular type of flow. For example, there's no deep troughing over the Hudson Bay and, and no massive ridging in Alaska or Greenland to promote that deep troughing. So that's going to be what our overall pattern is going to be able to do. So we look at it and say, okay, next seven days, knowing that week two is going to start to increase the precipitation in this area. What are we dealing with, though, for the next seven days? All the systems enter through the Pacific Northwest. Still much more precipitation on the way here. Then the first system is going to roll north. The second one's going to be a little bit further to the south, but they're not really going to be able to tap into much moisture. That was our story really from yesterday. So I don't have a, a massive change in your next week's forecast. It's the week two and beyond I think we should have a quick discussion about. So let's go and have a look at the near term. High res NAM this morning. We saw some light rain move through parts of Montana right into this part of the western side of the Dakotas. But there's actually a front this is linked up to that connects all the way up to a deeper load that's over parts of Ontario, Quebec, and the Hudson Bay. So playing through Friday, we're going to watch that front move through parts of the Great Lakes, Michigan, Wisconsin, dip through Iowa, come right back here. And that's where the rainfall might be by this afternoon getting into this evening. There it is. See it? Now, what we're going to watch after this is the next system enter into the Pacific Northwest. It's going to be Friday night, tonight, into Saturday morning, and playing through the day on Saturday. Again, you see a lot of green. That's where the model is saying that the mild air is too warm to be bringing these snow levels you know, down the sides of the mountains. So overall, this push of mild air coming in with quite a bit of rainfall, that's really round two of the multiple rounds we're going to be getting for the Pacific Northwest. So here we are on Saturday uh, evening playing into Sunday morning. And this is where we're going to watch our next system kind of roll across the northern tier of the United States. This is Sunday morning playing through midday Sunday. There are better chances of snow coming out of parts of Saskatchewan into Manitoba, getting into Ontario. And right now the models have kind of dropped this dividing line somewhere in this vicinity. You'll see the difference though in the GFS and European in just a few seconds. So that's what I got for you through midday Sunday. Don't forget uh, this weekend is the ending of daylight saving time. So we'll have to make sure we're accounting for that. All right, but if we do compare our GFS to the European, we've played through Friday into Saturday when that next deep low comes on shore. And then we watch that low pop out, see it right in through here. This is now Sunday evening. And again, you can see that the GFS has got its line right about there. The European's got a snow line right about there. So in parts of uh, you know Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, that's what we're looking at. For most of the northern tier of the U.S., though, we're, we're getting rain out of this. Now, as that system curls up over the Great Lakes, really good model representation here. Look at that, both the GFS and the Euro on, on point here. We got our third system coming into the northwest. So this will be early next week. We watch that one come out. It produces its next system, like I said, a little bit farther to the south here, midweek next week. Some rain spreading out ahead of this midweek. And then that system curls up into New England. So what I like is I just went out a, a week in the models. And if you were watching, kind of blurred your eyes and looked at both, they're both performing quite well and giving you this similar picture. Look at this, though. This is next Saturday, the 11th. We're starting to see low pressure development on the nose of the subtropical jet. And that's the thing we're trying to just keep a close eye on. How does that evolve uh, as we go forward? So from there, uh, I want to talk to you about some snow. So let's go have a, or no, let's go rain first, and then we'll look at snow. So the European model adding it all up, this is through the next seven days. That's all we're going to take the European model out to here. That's what we got in terms of total precip. So this is before the system start cranking up here. Just notice parts of the Pacific Northwest still capable of adding maybe another four to five inches of rain at uh, right here in the foothills. And then we see heavier precip in the northern Rockies. And then again, our two storm systems, one here, the second one there. But these rainfall amounts, just look at the colors. We're, we're down here in the color distribution, so this is not overly wet. Uh, the GFS, very similar. So that's the GFS forecast. There's the European. But the only thing I tell you is the GFS is a bit drier. But we've kind of found that to be an important trend in the model, that it tends to be a bit drier. Okay, on the snowfall side of it, in fact, I can blow that up one more time. Here's the snow getting added up. So there's that corridor of heavier snow by the time we get through the weekend. Then we're going to watch early next week. The next system does put down better chances for snow in the Rockies, as we saw. But if I take you out one week on snowfall, you get that from the GF, or so, excuse me, from the European, you get this from the GFS. 
So European Forecast GFS. And overall, you got to admit, the models are they're tracking pretty well uh, with one another at this point. Okay. So the drier side of this, the next seven days, this is the probability of getting less than a half of an inch. So while the northwest takes on all of the flow, we get these little weak systems that roll through here. Most of the rest of the country is left out of this. But now watch this. I'm going to go from day 7 out to day 10. Did you see the erosion of the risk of being dry down here? You can get the same effect if I take you back to a 7-day forecast and say, well, who's got a better chance of getting an inch? Now you see the wet corridors. But going from week 1 and adding in the first four days of week 2, look at that. That's the next step in watching this pattern evolve. And again, it's all born on the evolution of the subtropical jet. Here it comes. This is day 10, 11, 12. There it is, starting to show up down here, really increasing those week two precipitation forecasts. So the CPC saw it, the European model saw it, and the GFS is beginning to see it. And I'm just watching this so carefully for, for one reason. We talked about it. This is an area that needs to get the moisture. We had it in Texas. We've got to get it to push into the southeast. It's been so very dry in that area. Okay, that, that's what we're watching. Now, unfortunately, because this is coming in through Mexico, this isn't a major increase for precipitation in the southwest. We're waiting on the evolution of a proper subtropical jet to target the southwest later on in this year. So coming back to this near-term forecast, though, this is the outlook for our frost over the next seven days. And if you're looking at it going, that's kind of an odd to see this area frost free, but frost down here. Well, this is this morning. This was what happened this morning, and that's all out after this. So let's go and have a look at those high temperatures, because as I mentioned, we've got some mild air coming in. Here's Friday's highs. Look at that, back up into the 70s and maybe 80s in the plains, getting into Saturday. Broad scale warmth across most of the country compared to climatological average. Still a bit cool along the northern tier of the US. Here's Sunday, major warm up in the midsection of the country here. Then we get into Monday, that pushes east. By the time we get out into Tuesday, remember we're going to watch the backside of that system deliver a little bit of cooler air here. We have our next big push of moisture coming in, remember, early next week into the west, hence the cloud cover and cooler temperatures. But overall, the south, southeast stays warmest longest after we get this colder air out today. So why next Thursday do we see the cool down here? Well, remember, this is going to be behind the extension of the uh, Pacific jet that makes it across the country. We then go into reset mode where the Pacific jet or excuse me, ex um, contracts and the subtropical jet takes over. So to show you what happens beyond that, let's go to our five day sliding window of average temperature anomalies. There's your next five days. There's day five through 10. There it is, our cool down in the west. And then day 10 through 15, we again see a lack of deep cold air living in the United States. And we just don't have the right setup. It's not high amplitude. So we don't get that to be the case. OK, so these last few uh, tabs I want to go through here are going to be discussing some of the new long range stuff that I'll be watching this weekend. I intended to dig a bit deeper into this, but I want to wait until Sunday. And the reason for that is I'm going to get new seasonal forecast data from the European model. And I think it's going to be informative on what we're going to be watching in terms of this. So I love these Hofmuller diagrams. I think they just convey a lot of great information. And what they again show is today, going through the next 15 days from the European model. We're at 850 millibars, or 850 hectopascals. That's about a mile above the surface. And we're right here across the tropics. This is the whole of the tropics. Now you see the blue green here. That represents strong trade winds still associated with our very positive Indian Ocean dipole. We're going to lose this impact over the next 45 to 60 days. My question is, and this is what I want to see by Sunday's updates, do we start to see more of this behavior? Now the reds here would indicate a um, much stronger what we call westerly wind burst. And we expect to see repeated kind of time periods of this throughout this winter where you get these reds in this area. And that is associated with El Nino. Now, what's important about this is that for the last month or so, we haven't seen this size either being forecast or actually happening, this size of a westerly wind burst showing up. And it's starting to force the MJO to, to, to move around a little bit. So we've watched the MJO for the last several weeks almost just stay over here between phase eight and one. That's that black line in the middle. What it's doing now is it's kind of come back out over the Indian Ocean. But can you see how the models are trying to cut it right back over? They don't want to leave it away from this area for very long. What it isn't 
is that the MJO is not in phase 3-4 which means there is going to be sinking motion in the atmosphere there and rising motion in the atmosphere here. Now, what does that mean? That means this. When you look over the next 15 days, there's rising motion in phase one. There's going to be rising motion in phase eight initially here, okay? And then it's going to likely come over here eventually into parts of Central America and South America. Now, this was the one that confused me. I thought by seeing this, I'd see the models reflect better chances at moisture moving into Brazil. And that was what I made the case for all week. That That's a good signal to see something like that happen. But there, there must be something else controlling it. Maybe it's the Atlantic Meridiana mode. Maybe it's just the fact there's too much dry air over the Amazon. I don't know. But this did not produce a wetter signal in week two for, um, for Brazil. The most dominant thing is just the the descending air on phase three, four, five. And that will be around, I think, for another six weeks or so. So we have to ask, well, what might that mean? Well, first of all, I want to tell you something. We watched the Southern Oscillation Index come up. Okay, there it is. Now, we, that happened because we didn't see any good westerly wind bursts. We're going to watch this, I believe, start to drop right back down here throughout the first couple of weeks of November. That's an indication that... Um, El Nino is starting to have more of an influence on the pattern. The other indication is the strengthening of the subtropical jet we just mentioned for the last 15 minutes. Now, the other part of this, though, is, okay, this, this, this change in where this sinking motion is versus where this rising motion is. I think, though, that because the models want to just keep bringing this back over to phase 8 and 1, we are still expecting in the month of November to see pattern like this show up. That's MJO phase one in November or phase eight. If I go back and forth, you see some similarities overall. We continue to see better chances at Western North American troughing. And if that's the case, this is still why I think the month of November still has in it two to three big systems that start life in the West, roll through the, the Rocky Mountains, invigorate in the plains, and then roll toward the Northeast two of them. I think we have at least two of those coming up in this month because of the MJO movement. But I can't disagree with this. This has been a long-standing trend in the GF, or excuse me, the European Weekly, which it looks out there quite a ways for the mid-November to mid-December outlook. And we've now seen better evidence for this with the building of the subtropical jet. But at the same time, if when the subtropical jet backs off, we get a trough in the west coast then this makes sense and systems coming out in the midwest makes sense to me and finishing in new england what i don't see right now at least through the middle of this month and possibly beyond is i don't know where a really sharp arctic outbreak is going to come from i don't i just don't see it quite yet uh, as to where we could just get a big plowing in of really cold air if that changes of course we'll we'll bring the update i just don't see it as of right now uh, so will we see much of a change in this map, which is what we've had season to date so far for snowfall? Um, in other words, I'm not right now overly keen on the next at least 15 days as to drop in a big cyclone that just dumps snow. Uh, it fills in either the Midwest or, or New England or really honestly even the West. So this map may look like this, kind of be static for, for several days. But I have had several colleagues kind of chit-chatting about something that we have to start talking about, and that's the strength of the polar vortex. Now, we looked at it earlier this week, but I'm going to give you a new kind of long-range forecast. So as you look at this, we're going to look at the um, 10 hectopascal. That is in the stratosphere, zonal average wind, okay? Now, what does all that mean? When the polar vortex, represented here in the forecast by these blue lines, is above this line right here, it's strong. And if it's strong, especially once you get into December, January, February, March, then it's hard to get cold air to just, I'm talking like brutally cold air to spill out of the Arctic. Now, some folks were chattering that right now the models are taking through the middle of the month. Okay, this is through the 16th, taking the polar vortex to a strong level. That's why I'm telling you, I don't see any, I mean, I can't even find in the polar vortex a source for some cold air, let alone all the normal things that control cold air in the month of November. For both here, Europe, I mean, the whole of the Northern Hemisphere. Um, but you, know, you start to see the models saying, hey, bring this back down. But the spread is so huge, we can't make sense of this. We can't, we can't use this as an indicator that there's going to be something crazy happening in December. 
I just want you to know I'll watch it and try to keep a, a close eye on it. What I wanted to finish with, though, uh, was uh, another quick international update. So we talked at the beginning about the drying trend here. This is going to be an issue. Later on today, we get planting updates for uh, Brazil, and I'll be very keen to watch how those changed. Don't see a change in the flooding in southern Brazil either. That's going on. Most of Europe continues to stay wetter, as you can see here. And this part of Africa staying this wet is largely because we're sinking air here, and it is rising in this area. But I do want to point out that in Australia, look at the wetter conditions now being forecast east. This is along the River Murray, maybe down into the Darling River Basin, and where we've had all of those wildfires in the uh, Northern Territory here. We talked about this, what was that, last week? We see better rainfall trying to get into that area. So that's going to be something important to watch out for. If you don't mind, I'm going to give you one last map. I'm going to go to my website, agweather.com. I'm going to click on temperature forecasts, slide down a bit because I wanted to show you kind of the 10-day uh, outlook for the whole planet. So when I mention I don't see a whole lot of really, really cold air coming in the northern hemisphere, it just seems to be kind of tucked away in a couple of places. And outside of those areas, not really having that deep of cold air, we're just going to have to wait later in the season before we start to see more of a winter type setup. So uh, I think that's where I'll finish today. I look forward to talking again on Monday, and uh, we'll kind of watch these trends over the weekend. Have a good one. Thanks.